Skin mesh renders just do not scale up well for large scale games where you have dozens, hundreds, or thousands of animators active all at the same time. This is for a couple of reasons. Number one, the skin mesh renderer is skinned, so the CPU has to do the skinning, and that's done on the main Unity thread. Number two, because these are skinned meshes, Unity doesn't batch them by default, and there's not a simple way for you to just batch them automatically. That increases the number of draw calls, so we have the main Unity thread being taken up by skinning, and a whole bunch of draw calls going on, and that murders your performance. In this tutorial video, we're gonna look at a different way that we can have animated meshes, removing the skin mesh renderers entirely from our scene. That will solve at least the problem of the CPU skinning and give us a very large performance benefit. Hey, Chris here from Mom Academy, here to help you. Who, me? Yes, you. Make your game dev dreams become a reality by providing you some optimization options for your game. At a high level, optimizations usually come in a couple flavors. The one we're gonna look at today is pre-computing something so we don't have to compute it at runtime. This is a trade-off of CPU time for memory usage because we calculated it, so we don't have to calculate it later, but we have to know about it already. It's very similar to what we do with lighting. A lot of times we'll have baked lighting so we don't have to compute it at runtime. There are some drawbacks here is it's not as dynamic and it uses more memory. What we're going to do is take a scene object and simulate the animation in the scene view, not in play mode, and we're going to update the animator every x milliseconds, however many FPS you want to bake the animation at, and take a snapshot of the mesh at that tick and store that mesh. In this one specifically, I have a 30 FPS baked animation, so it's like I don't know, 30 frames or something of the one animation. We have 30 different meshes, and what we're gonna do at runtime is just cycle between these stored meshes. That saves us a lot of performance because it's relatively cheap to swap out a mesh versus computing all the positions that that mesh should be at. Let's take a look at how does it work. And then towards the end of the video, we'll talk about when you might choose to do this and when you might not want to do this, because this is definitely not a one size fits all solution. The system's composed of two components. One is the animated mesh scriptable object, and one of them is the animated mesh mono behavior. In the mono behavior, we just have a reference to which scriptable object we're gonna be using. We expose a public void play that accepts an animation name, and it will start animating that mesh by first finding which animation matches that, then keeping a reference to that list of which meshes should we cycle through. And an update, we just check if the time.time .time has ticked far enough. If it has, then we change the mesh filter mesh that we're using. I've also added in a way for you to tell whenever a particular animation has ended by this on animation end event. To use this, we're using a custom editor window. I'm not gonna go into too much depth of how this is. If you wanna see all the details of this, you can open it up in the GitHub repository, link in the description, which has this full project and these scripts. The important part here is we call this generate models whenever you click a button, which creates a new scriptable object. And the key pieces here are on the animator, we are playing that clip updating it using animator.update based on how many FPS we've defined, and then using the skinned mesh render bake mesh. So we end up generating a large number of models, especially as you increase that animation FPS. And that's really the biggest drawback of this is instead of at runtime computing all the offsets and the skinning locations of each of these meshes, instead we pre-computed them and we're using them and just cycling through them, which is a very fast operation compared to the skinning process. To use this, all you have to do is go to tools, animated mesh creator, that gives you a window that you can dock and you're gonna wanna pull a scene object. You can technically drag one from the project view, but it just doesn't really work because it's not animating anything from the project view. I'm gonna drag this one animated model on the corner. It's gonna give me a name, armature 368, and then just adds animation on there. And then it chooses an FPS. I use 30 in this and it looks pretty smooth, but you can do 60 or 100. Just keep in mind the higher FPS, the more meshes are gonna be generated. That impacts your build size and also your runtime memory usage because you have to store all those in memory. If we click dry run, you'll just see the animations play on the model and it won't generate any files. So if this one now we click generate scriptable objects, we'll see that it takes quite a while because it needs to first create the mesh, save the mesh, and then import the mesh. And we're generating probably a couple hundred meshes here. Cool. What I could do now that it's done is open up the prefab and just tell it to use this other scriptable object. We'll see that it has two animations, idle that has almost 300 meshes, 
and run S, which only has 37 meshes, and it's gonna animate at 60 FPS. If I click play again, change it to use the mesh animators, and we'll see they're animating a lot more smoothly now because we're actually using the 60 FPS animations. Performance-wise, we're getting almost the exact same thing as we were getting last time. We'll see on average to animate these 800-ish models, we're getting less than two milliseconds per frame. So on frames where we're not animating, you'll see that there's a dip because we're not gonna actually do any of that mesh swapping on the ones where we do need to do something, it's higher as we swap out those meshes. Let's quickly talk a little bit about the animator setup that you're gonna to wanna to use to bake these animations using the system. If I select this game object, you'll see that has a very simple animator and that's on purpose. On the transitions, you're gonna to wanna to make sure that the transitions from one state to another state do not have any blending. By default in the animator, there's usually some kind of blending that happens because that results in a much smoother transition from one state to the next. However, if we're going to bake the frames of an animation from an animator, we do not want any blending because this one animation is going to continually loop. At least in a lot of cases, they will loop. If we continually loop including that transition, that's where we'll end up getting into some weird animation stuff happening. So we want each state to be discrete and only with that one animation, no blending, at least for most cases. If you have some animations that will only be transitioned to from a particular state and does not loop, you might find that the blend actually gives you a better animation result. Something weird that I also found was necessary was to make sure that you can transition from any state to the other state. I thought if you just did animator.play, it would play it regardless if there was a transition, but I had some problems in making that work if I didn't provide an any state transition to that particular state. I wanna give a quick shout out to all of my Patreon supporters. Without you, this channel would not be possible. At the phenomenal tier, there's Andrew Bowen and Andrew Albright. And at the awesome tier, there's Gerald Anderson, Autumn K, Matt Parkin, Ivan, and Rulin. You can show your support at patreon.com slash Academy to get your name up here or a voice shout out starting at the awesome tier. Thank you all for your support. I am so grateful. Now, as you've seen the implementation, you can tell this is by no means perfect. It might not even be good. I'll let you decide. It did take me from about 15 FPS on my mobile device to almost 60 constantly though. So let's talk about then why you would choose to use this versus skin mesh renderers or GPU instancing. Well, for starters, you already know how to implement this. So that's a plus and it does perform pretty well. If you have relatively discrete animation states where you don't need the blending and it's not really noticeable, your game style doesn't call for you needing that blending, this could work well for you. If you don't have a lot of animations and you don't have really detailed animations where you can bake the animation at a lower FPS, that also works pretty well. It is relatively simple to implement once we have that editor script that will bake the animation for us, which is included in this repository, GitHub link in the description. So what are some of the drawbacks here? Number one is what we've implemented so far does not support animation events. You can support them by reading the animation clip and syncing it to the time and the frame and whenever you hit that one frame, you can raise it. Just you need to extend the data model of our animation class to support when you should raise that animation event and call that thing. Number two, you can probably tell, it's not super flexible because we have to have one discrete animation, play that, and then play the next animation. So there's not a good way to blend between them because we'd have to like try to morph our meshes together, which is basically what the CPU skinning is doing. And that'd be expensive and kind of defeat the purpose of this. We're baking a mesh, so we're basically copying the mesh for each frame of the animation. Well, that's exactly what we're doing, is we're copying the entire mesh for every frame of the animation, which is a lot of mesh data if you have high poly meshes. And then if you want to talk about using 60 or 100 FPS animations, that is just a lot of meshes to have. If you got value out of this video, go ahead and like and subscribe to help the channel grow, reach more people, and add value to more people. This new video is posted every Tutorial Tuesday, and I'll see you next week.